Hi there. We are uh, working with some new software here today at uh, FCBC, but still trying to produce the same quality um, quality broadcasts that we've uh, been doing in the past. So please be patient with us as we continue or begin our study on um, on Satan and demons. Or, very, or sorry, angels, Satan and demons, rather. So we get to talk about a really exciting um, uh, exciting study uh, today that I'm personally just absolutely thrilled about and i'm really thankful that we get to do it so let's open our time with a word of prayer heavenly father we thank you for the great opportunity to study your word we thank you for the technology that allows us to uh, to stream these studies and to uh, broadcast them so that we might enjoy them together over sometimes great distances all the way across the world so please bless this time and study in jesus name we pray amen well, so this uh, today's study is actually a very, very special one um, to me, and it's a special one to me because uh, I personally have come quite a long distance in my spiritual journey uh, about it, um, and that is because I always fell into probably the primary, what I'm going to call the primary pitfall. There's two pitfalls that we can fall into in talking about uh, Satan and angels and demons, um, and uh and and one of them is uh, is to be is to be obsessed, and the other one is to be ignoring. And I was always ignoring. I always kind of thought that perhaps uh, maybe that this was a a field of of study or interest that was kind of the more low brow when it comes to theology. But what we find is that scripture is. Uh, Scripture is very clear that the Bible or that the angels and the angelic world is real, and uh, important. Uh, to, to for us to understand. So with that, we'll go right ahead into um, our study today. Um, let's see here. All right. So um, we're going to go through once again our, our, our study on or our dis- divisions of systematic theology. First of all, we have the prolegomena. That's your thoughts about your thinking. <laughs> If you like your thoughts about what is it that you think or that you know or that you understand about um, the the Bible, the Word of God, how we know things and such like. Next, we looked at bibli- bibliology, um, and that is what the Bible has to say about the Bible or what we believe about the Bible and how we uh, understand that. Theology proper is what we believe about uh, about the nature, character of God, and and uh, those kind of very basic ideas about God, and kind of I put uh, patriology or study of the God the Father in that group. Christology is the study of Jesus Christ. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Pneumatology is what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? Angelology, what do you believe about angels? Anthropology, what do you believe about people? Hamartiology, what do you believe about sin? Soteriology, what do you believe about? salvation, ecclesiology, what do you believe about the church, Israelology, what do you believe about Israel, and eschatology, what do you believe about uh, the end times. So these uh, divisions, if you like, are again here to help us try to get our mind around, be sort of like a bookcase for uh, organizing thoughts, organizing things that we've understood, and organizing uh, scriptural information so that when we come up to a passage that involves, in this case, angels, we can uh, pack that away with our angelology. Now, of course, we will not have the time uh, today to cover the immense subject of angels, Satan, and demons. Um, but again, this is meant to be an overview. It's meant to just wet your taste buds, to give you a, a sense of knowing, like, I've, there, I've got a lot deeper to dig when it comes to these things, which is, of course, always the case um, in, in theology. Um, and, uh, and yet, here we are uh, looking at angels. So when it comes to looking at angels, uh, we find that we are always having to uh, keep ourselves on guard. So today we're studying angels, and on the topic of angels, we want to note that there are worldly traps and pitfalls, a many, a many for, um, 
for this topic. Uh, there's many worldly traps and pitfalls because people become obsessed and, and tend to overemphasize and, and get overly concerned with the angelic world or the angelic conflict. They start to think that's the only thing uh, that the Bible has revealed, and that's not the only thing the Bible has revealed by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, quite to the contrary, it's, it's one of the very important things about what the Bible reveals, but there's lots of important things that the Bible has to reveal far more centering around Jesus Christ, his person, far more uh, to do with uh, the salvation and the redemption of planet Earth, and ultimately God and his glory. So we can fall into that pitfall when we consider angels of starting to try to make it all about uh, angels and all about demons, and and really what we see is that it's an important issue that we don't want to either overemphasize or underemphasize, but give the same amount of emphasis um, that Scripture is. So... um, when we think about these worldly traps, we want to look at the first one, which I like to call manipulating angels. We come to the this idea very frequently, and uh, many, 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 many people will believe in angels. In fact, throughout world history, we'll see that there have been people who uh, who believe in angels, whether they're you know of a Judeo-Christian background or otherwise, because angels have been involved in this earthly drama since the very, very, very beginning of created time and space. And so, of course, all the ancient cultures and times and peoples and places have their own ideas about angels or angelic beings. Sometimes they would call them gods uh, and various other other things. So, um, so yeah, um, that's that's kind of the idea. Uh, uh, that's the idea is that people will use attempt to use to manipulate the powers of uh, the powers that be in order to uh, use their names in fact ancient magic was always that um so the ancient magic was always uh, oftentimes lists of names lists of names of powerful people who could then overtake or over uh you know, overtake or take over, uh, and and obsess or possess or try to appeal to these gods or these angelic beings or probably more accurately demonic beings, uh, and manipulate them by kind of controlling them by name. In fact, we see this even into uh, the church today. People trying to manipulate angels and trying to find out what their names are, looking at other ancient sources, and um, seeking to manipulate them or control them. And what we see in Scripture is that angels are created beings, or the celestial beings are created beings of another class of another order and we are not designed we are not meant to be trying to manipulate them boss them around tell them what to do or even ask them for favors so one of the the pitfalls or the traps that we want to avoid at any cost is uh trying to manipulate angels or thinking that uh, by doing so we can uh, improve or change our lot in life we're meant uh and so that goes hand in hand with the next possible pitfall, which is praying to angels, people who are trying to have a direct relationship with angels. What we see in scripture is very clear, and that is that the um, interactions between humans and angels are um, are rare, uh, and when they are rare, they're, uh, they're shocking, they're frightening, right? Angels always have to show up and say, don't be afraid because it's so surprising. So it uh, it's not a normative, uh, it's not a normal uh, action in hardly anyone's life. And for those for whom it is, it seems it continues to be jarring all the way through the vision as with Zechariah or John or Ezekiel. It doesn't seem like they ever kind of get used to it or get comfortable with uh, the angelic world in the sense that they're not meant to. It's a supernatural world. So Praying to angels or trying to build a relationship with angels in some, or an individual angel is a very uh, common trap amongst a certain swath of people that is clearly uh, not endorsed by Scripture. Next, overemphasizing angels. And again, we spoke about this at the beginning, but the idea of making angels or trying to overemphasize angels and make that the most important thing, either in terms of overemphasizing the uh, the the elect angels, the saved angels, or rather, I shouldn't say saved, the elect angels, the the, the holy angels, God's angels, and um, either trying to manipulate them or focus them or even quasi-worship them, as we see, is, a, is an absolute anathema in Scripture, um, or the demonic world, as on the other side. The demonic world will uh, tend to have that same uh, 
problem attached to it. People who see a demon behind every bush or think that they're, you know, specially equipped to see the demons or, or perceive the demonic activity or, you know, there's various uh, folks who get so obsessed with the idea of trying to uh, thwart Satan and his plan and that they become kind of demon hunters to some degree. And that sort of behavior is completely not, again, endorsed by Scripture. So we want to avoid that at all costs. And the reason why we want to put these cautions up so very seriously, and I, I mean this, is because um, this is a blessed topic. This is an important topic. When we think about God's angelic messengers, we find that they're of incredible value and incredible import in understanding God's character and who He is. So we don't want to uh, be downplaying or overplaying them. We want to be have that what we believe about angels, Satan, and demons uh, in perfect scriptural order. So, okay. So anyway, uh, we move on. The language used for angels is the next uh, picture we'd like to talk about. We're actually not going to cover all of <clears throat> all the words used for angel because we do see that they're sometimes called stars, and they're some very rarely, but in scripture called sons of God. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> There's some they're called sons of God, but these are the primary, primary words used. So first of all, uh, in the Old Testament, the most common word is malach, and the malach is a uh, um, angel. Just means messenger, angel. It's actually derived or related to the word for king, malach, and it gives us this uh, picture of their kind of royal messenger um, status. Their st uh, their their per primary function or purpose is to is to do that. So, um, is to, to be a messenger for God. Next, we see Angelon is an angel. And the angels, uh, is actually where we get the English word angel. Uh, this is the Greek word most commonly used for angels, but it's also used for earthly messengers. So, um, we see that it's, in fact, in that regard, um, both. It's the, it's the Angelon, that is to say, the angels that are uh, heavenly messengers and earthly messengers, but the idea is always uh, message, messenger or message. Um, so as we move forward, the next word we'll look at is uh, seraphim, and seraphim is probably very familiar to you. Seraph or seraphim uh, are the angelic beings that sit in the throne room of God, mentioned only once by name. We might see them arguably in... Um, in um, we might see them occasionally in the uh, book of Revelation, not occasionally, but as the four living creatures, arguably, whether they're the same exact uh, designation or not, we don't know. So um, that is that is uh, the seraphim, and then we have cherubim, and cherubim are uh, the those who are... Um, those who are cherubs, they see, again, we have this uh, bad idea from the worldly world culture about a cherub as being like a cute, fat little baby angel with a diaper. Um, but we find that this is, that the baby, uh, these aren't little fat babies. In fact, there are no fat baby angels, and there are no angels that we know that take on an expressly female form. We see uh, angels taking on mostly, uh, apparently, the form of young men. And then there are these uh, special classes that we might call celestial beings is probably better, but angels, um, angels is sometimes used as a catch-all for that, that whole other created order of, of, of beings. Um, and so the cherubim seem to be quite important to judgment of God. Um, then we get to our next, um, next group. Yep, our next group, Se'irim. Uh, Seirim is the word, the Old Testament word for demons. It's used very infrequently in the Bible, um, but the idea of a demon uh, being involved, and uh, in Greek, of course, where we get our English word demon, daimonio. So daimonio is is a demon again, uh, and that's where we get the word. It's uh, as we'll see, I believe, a fallen angel. So those are the words that we're going to tend to see most often. Again, there are others like uh, the sons of God and um, the. Uh, often referred to as stars and others, and, and Satan has a set of titles his own, um, like Satan, Diablos, Devil, and so on. So uh, we see those, but just to get us used to some of those words that are attached to uh, angelic beings. So now we've looked at the angels, or the language used for angels, and we want to correct one more uh, pitfall or one more common misconception, and that's that angels are not 
Angels are not dead people. Uh, we very frequently, in, in fond terms, will say something like, heaven just gained an angel when, when a person passes on. And that's not true. Heaven gained a saint of God. That's what heaven gained. Heaven gained a, a child of God, returned home. But as far as angels, we find that that was not their creation. Uh, that was not their uh, genesis. It's not as if there's more angels ha- uh, occurring, coming into heaven and graduating. We don't graduate into angelhood by any stretch of the imagination. So we want to make it very, very clear that angels are not the spirits of past, uh, you know, people who are passed on. That's not uh, what the Bible and pictures. That is a uh, we might, you might call that a worldly idea. And that's the hardest thing about this is when we come, when it comes to understanding angels in the Bible, our biggest challenge is with most theology is untying our cultural ideas, untying our cultural expectations from what is actually in the biblical text. So we're going to look up a lot of scripture in the course of this study. And um, the, the reason for that is, is that there's no way that we can justifiably uh, come to an understanding of of, of angels apart from what God has revealed in Scripture, or else we're inevitably going to fall into either some ancient pagan ideas like the baby cherubs or the, uh, you know, the ladies in pretty white dresses, or, you know, even, what was it, the bishop's bishop's wife and uh, uh, it's a wonderful world, kind of play fast and loose with angels, which again, for their little narratives of their stories were fine, um, but we're going to see that that those are not necessarily rooted in Scripture, right? So just remember, not every cultural idea you have is related to that. So we're going to look first at the elect angels. That's a, a term used uh, once, and these elect angels is a, is a phrase used for the uh, holy angels, or we might say God's angels, or the angels that are uh, still aligned with God. And we're going to note that there's only two angels that are recognized by name. That is Michael and Gabriel, and they both are named uh, for very specific purposes, and they both have very specific functions in Scripture. Now, various pseudo-epigraphic works and extra-biblical works will come out with all these names of other uh, angels of Azrael and these and that, that and those. Um, and we want to note that uh, while there may or may not be angelic beings that go by that name, it is very valuable to recognize that God only gave us the names of two angels, not many, because it shows us how we're meant to relate. We're not meant to be calling angels by name. We're not meant to be calling out to angels by name. There's there's a couple that have very important functions that relate to us, and so we're given their names. But as far as the great mass of other angels, we get very little information about them, as is God's intent and design. Nevertheless, we're going to start uh, by looking at Daniel uh, 10.21 to see Michael. Um, and so you see, Daniel is of one of our more important books when it comes to understanding um, angels. Not that they're not everywhere; they are. They're uh, all throughout Scripture. But Daniel has some special interactions with angels and how they uh, interact with people and how they interact with world affairs and world events. And so Daniel becomes an important book because he was very specially given uh, revelation about the movement and function of angels. So um, Daniel eight sixteen. Daniel 8, 16, whoops, I'm on the wrong page here. In Daniel's great visions, um, we see uh, 8, 16 says, I have, I have heard him, is that right? Daniel 10, 21, goodness. That's Gabriel, one second. That's wrong. Daniel 10, 21, we'll be back in Daniel, so definitely stay there. Daniel 10, 21, sorry, tells us about Michael, and it says, uh, but I will show you what is inscribed in the scripture of truth. There is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. So here Michael is pictured as an archangel, a prince, an authority, and he has a special relationship with Israel. So he has, this archangel has a special cause, a special purpose in being, uh, again, with Israel. Then uh, if we go to 921, or sorry, uh, 12 one, Goodness, I shouldn't have put both of those points on screen at the same time, should I? Um, It says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people. So again, speaking to Daniel, talking about Israel, we see that um, Michael here, the archangel, and there may be 
others, but it seems that he's the archangel. Ark has the idea of ruler, king, or top. So he's the top angel. Very likely, uh, he's the one who was ascended to replace Satan in his once he fell. Um, but uh, that's a bit of assumption in that. Nevertheless, we see that Daniel has been revealed that Michael has a special job and a special calling, a special function and purpose in uh, protecting Israel. Right? We've got some other passages that you can look up to uh, look up on that. First Thessalonians four sixteen, Jude nine, Revelation twelve seven through ten. Gabriel is also revealed to Daniel um, in Daniel 8.16. That was the one I was trying to go to a little bit prematurely before. But it says, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So Gabriel here seems to have a special role as a messenger or as one who explains to humans. Now, it could be that other times where angels, and there are a handful of other times where angels are used to explain a vision or explain a, a revelation to a prophet like Zechariah or someone else. Um, and oftentimes that's the angel of the Lord, which we'll look at uh, momentarily, and we have looked at in the past. But um, it seems that Gabriel you know, often has that job, and so we don't know if when he goes unnamed or goes unrecognized that that might be the same on rare occasion, or on some occasion. Nevertheless, with that, we go to uh, Luke 119 and Luke 26 through 38. Of course, these are longer passages, so we won't read them, but Luke 119 shows that Gabriel is the one who is... Uh, Luke 1, 1 through 19, is Gabriel uh, being used and utilized, sent by God to... A, proclaim the conception and, and forthcoming birth of John the Baptist. And then in 26 through 38, Gabriel is the one who announces that same event to Mary. And so what we see is that Gabriel is specifically known because he's going to show up with uh, messages from time to time, right? So that's the other angel we know. Now we get this phrase, elect angels, and we want to note that from the uh, rest of the information that we have in Scripture, the elect angels are called, it's that word elect, it has the idea of being chosen, um, but the elect angels, just like the elect people, seem to be elect because they chose not to fall. They chose not to reject God. They were in that um, in that state of grace. They'd been created. They'd been created holy and proper, and certain angels, as we'll see, fell. Satan fell and chose to worship himself, wanted to be like God, and certain fell with him. And interestingly, um, we have those angels who cho did not choose to fall, who chose to stay. They remained the elect or the chosen angels. And uh, it gives us a good set of insights into what it means when the Bible talks about election, right? Election are those who choose to be chosen, if you might say in that regard. Those who put their faith in Christ become the elect of, uh, of God in Christ and their position in Christ. Those elect angels are the ones, they were all created holy, but those are the ones that did not uh, rebel against God's purpose. They remained you know, elect or chosen in that case. Next, uh, we see the principalities and powers. These principalities and powers is a, an expression that's used very, very frequently uh, in Scripture. Uh, we'll just turn to Romans 8.38 for a moment and, and look at that and see how that relates. And we'll see that it's a powerful verse about it. But the uh, it's important that we note when we see principalities and powers or authorities in Scripture, it is occasionally referring to um, earthly authorities, earthly kings, governors, and such, and it's usually very clear when that happens. But it often is referring to the spiritual authorities, both holy and unholy, uh, that are active at work and effective here in this world, though unseen and often maybe even unnoticed by us. Um, so Romans 8.18 uh, gives us the or 838 sorry Romans 838 gives us the following information it says we know that all things work together for good of those who love God those who are called according to his purpose and did I grab the wrong verse of course I did 28 38 it says uh, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities uh, nor powers nor things present nor things to come neither height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord so here we see that the angels and demons are um, are, are created beings of course and that they have authority they're angels and we notice that uh, that 
interesting statement. Neither angels nor principalities nor powers. So here using those principalities and powers to focus the or turn the focus to the, the demonic or the uh, satanic world, right? They're created, they're under God's control, and most importantly, what we want to note is that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ from this verse, that the demonic or the angelic world, no one can take that away from you. No one can separate you from the love of Christ, no matter how much Satan might hate or rail against us. They are powers, they are authorities, uh, and they have authority. That is to say, they've been given authority by God, or they've seized that authority, as in the case of, of Satan and his angels. Um, but uh, that authority is not in any way able to threaten what God has said, what God has declared, and what God has done. Let's go to Colossians uh, 1.16 real quick. And Colossians 1.16 tells us, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So again, these principalities and powers, God created these angels. This is referring to the angelic world, that they had function, that they had purpose in his administration. They still have purpose in his administration of planet Earth, even though uh, Satan and the demons have defected and um, you know, could maybe changed some of the functions as a result. But the reality, again, being that God created them. And we might say, well, if God's omnipotent and God's omniscient, why in the world would he go to all this trouble to create these other creatures to do his will? Why would he create these angels when he's everywhere and he's all-powerful? He could just speak everything into happening. Hopefully you picked it up as I was describing that argument or that complaint or that concern. Well, God doesn't need to use you or I either. He could use any other, you know, man manner of you know, communication. But this is what he's chosen to do is work through his creatures, work through the things that the, the beings, the persons that he created. Not that angels are people, but they are persons. They have personality and personhood um, of their own. And God has chosen to work through and include and involve his uh, creations. And that includes uh, angels. And so uh, we see that that is the case in humanity, on the in the earthly realm, in the physical, visible, visual realm, visible realm, and in Satan, uh, in the spiritual world as well. So they're there. They have uh, authority. They have function. They have seems seemingly some structure and hierarchy, to one degree or another. We're not sure just how much. Um, next, we see these uh, the cherubim. A cherub is uh, guarding in the. Uh, in Genesis, when Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, we have a cherub holding a flaming sword, keeping them from going back in so they don't get access to the tree of life, so that they, if they were to have access to the tree of life, they would be eternally separated from God, and there would be no hope to save them. So a cherub with a flaming sword uh, gives us a picture of the judgment and the uh, v extreme reverential position that these cherubs have. You wouldn't mess with a cherub, if you like. Exodus 25, 18 through 20. Um, let's turn to that passage just briefly because it is such a, such a beautiful passage. Whoops. I'm working from the MEV, the Modern English Version today, which is a, a lovely translation, really enjoyable to work from. Um, but Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, it's the second one, right? There we are. 25, 18. Now here in the uh, Exodus 25, we see that God is giving instructions for Moses to uh, to construct the, the tabernacle and all the different parts and pieces. And when he gets to verse 18, where are we now? He's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat, make one cherub on one end and the other cherub on the other end. From the mercy seat you shall make the cherubim on its own on its two ends. The cherubim shall stretch forth their wings upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to face toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat above upon the ark. In the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. I will meet with you there, and I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, and between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you, and all that I will command you for the uh, children of Israel. So here's this picture of the cherubim, and these are the winged angels, and of course the seraphim are winged angels as well, that we often see. However, we come to that misconception 
that angels are always winged, when in fact most appearances of angels we see no wings at all. Wings are not a part of it. Usually they appear seemingly as a as a young male figure, not uh, not regularly do they appear winged um, in their way. Uh, so these, however, are these cherubs are the winged angels and uh, here they're kneeling on either side of the either side of the cover of the or the top top of the ark of the covenant uh, and showing their position where their wings kind of span over them and meet in the middle as they uh, as they bow towards one another again probably uh, human in form but with the uh, wings off of the off the back um, so that's a picture of cherubim then we see our uh, seraphim and we only get a picture, or at least seraphim by name, in Isaiah 6, 2 through 7. So we'll go to Isaiah 6, 2 through 7. And of course, it just pains me. This is such a wonderful topic of Scripture and one that I neglected for so much of my Christian life that I'm passionate about looking it up, but it's going to mean an extra... Uh, yeah, an extra painful lesson for me in terms of foregoing a great deal of information that we could share on angels, Satan, and demons. Nevertheless, angel uh, Isaiah 6, 2 through 7 says, Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people un of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So here we see the seraphim, and the seraph. So now this is... Uh, something about Hebrew. When we want to pluralize something in English, we add S. When they want to pluralize something in Hebrew in general, they add uh, im, these im endings. So a single cherub, several is cherubim. A single seraph, several is seraphim, right? And so these seraphs are these, uh, to us, wild creatures that seem to be, and any human who gets to see creatures like this, they go, well, it's like, it had a face like this, and it ends like this, and they compare it to what we know, which is uh, human, uh, or sorry, earthly animals, terrestrial animals. And yet, uh, we see is that they're obviously reaching, grasping, trying to figure out a, a good way to explain that. And it's not easy. It's not easy to do. Um, so uh, we see that when we look at all of these animals, as Charlie Clough uh, once pointed out, when we look at all these animals, we find out that they're, we get confused sometimes. We might think that animals are, or angels are made of animal parts, but really animals are made of angel parts. Animals are made of a uh, composite. So when we, when they see these seraphs and seraphim and we say, well, wings like an eagle or stork-like wings or whatever it is, we're noting that the, uh, chronological likelihood is is that when God created the animals he used uh, the same parts or inspiration or similarities from the angelic world not the other way around as the secular world would say they're just you know making composite creatures of some kind um, based on mythologies but that's uh, not the case and that explains why uh, most of the ancient mythologies have the confusion that they have all these you know satyrs and half this and half that's right uh that that have worked their way into the various you know greek and norse and you know roman pagan mythologies why are they there well because that is a, an accurate representation of the collective memory of people passed down from the angels that have interacted with humans early on particularly in the garden of eden so uh, the next uh, point we want to look at is the angel of Jehovah. And I've got quite a group of, of, of uh, scriptures here for you to look at. The angel of Jehovah or the angel of Yahweh, or in most cases you'll have the angel of the Lord with all smaller capital letters. So if you have the angel of the Lord, you'll see uh, that that is, and we looked at this in our Christology study, that is an image for the pre-incarnate Christ. That is when Jesus Christ shows up before the incarnation, before the virgin birth, and he shows up to be involved in what's going on, to take personal view. And we, we won't uh, repeat that study today in the interest of time, but we see that the angel of the Lord says and does things that no other angel does. Angels talk about God says, the Lord says, 
the angel of the Lord says, I say, I say unto me. And the angel of the Lord is, uh, when other angels are worshipped or shown undue reverence, they reject it if they're elect, if they're saved, if they're uh, righteous, holy angels. I'm going to stop saying saved. Uh, holy angels. Then they say uh, they're, they're elect and they're, uh, they would reject worship. But the angel of the Lord accepts worship and accepts being called uh, Yahweh or Jehovah or the Lord. So it's very uh, important to know that angel of Jehovah is not just another angel, right? So now we move on to our study of um, their ministry. So we've got an idea of kind of where they are, what they're called, where the, who they are. Uh, and now we want to ask, what do they do? What do those angels do? So we see first and foremost that angels are available at key moments in uh, history. So first of all, we look, go to Job 38. It's a beautiful passage uh, in a wonderful book. You remember Job had uh, been tested, uh, been destroyed really by Satan at the permission of uh, the Lord. Uh, the Lord allowed Satan to test Job and take all that he had, including his health and almost to the point of his life, but not touch his life. And then his friends argued and fought about it. And he said, I want to talk to God. I want to take my complaint right to the top. And then God showed up and put him and all of us in his place. Um, verse uh, Job 38, 7 tells us, or actually let's go to 6. Let's go back to 4. We're where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if you have understanding, who has determined its measures, if you know, or who has stretched the line upon it, or what are its foundations fastened? To what are its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So we see here, uh, one, this Hebrew poetry pattern, they're called the morning stars, and then uh, that is clarified by the sons of God. So these angels, or the angelic uh, being, celestial beings, are, right, are called the sons of God. Now I would say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that because of our position in Jesus Christ, we can be called sons of God. Israel was called children of God, but this special phrase, the sons of God, is used rarely in Scripture and only in this specific way uh, for angelic beings, which it clearly is here because there were no humans around to uh, sing or worship God at the time of, of the creation. They had yet to be created. Um, so we see that these angels were given a very specific uh, role, if you'd say that, uh, to to glorify God at the moment of creation, to be witnesses, if you like, for the moment of creation. Acts seven fifty three, Galatians three nineteen, and Hebrews two two, all highlight the reality that uh, angels were present and involved at the time of the giving of the law. That angels superintended; they were they were active in that uh, purpose. Then we see that angels were also involved at the key moments in uh, the Lord's ministry. Of course, Luke 2.13 records one of our favorite events that we read almost every year at some point, or you're likely to hear around Christmas time. Um, but it says, Suddenly there was with the angel a company of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. So the shepherds are out watching their flocks by night, as the old hymn goes, and um, these angels, uh, an angel appears and tells them, gives them the scoop, and then a bunch, a whole group, a host of angels show up and speak. Um, you know, tradition has them singing, but it seems from Scripture they spoke in unison this wonderful message, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. What a surprising thing that is. But what we see is that the uh, arrival of Jesus Christ came with angelic announcement. It's almost as if while the Lord's plan and the humility of the coming of Christ was, uh, was certainly almost secret, quiet. It was unnoticed by the world, entirely unnoticed by the world, or very nearly unnoticed entirely unnoticed by the world and yet heaven couldn't bear it and that the lord allowed this angelic host to come and sing and and proclaim that the most remarkable event in human history had occurred so angels do that uh, angels have that purpose we see angels again in matthew 4 11 of course matthew 4 at the beginning of the chapter describes the temptation of jesus christ as the second adam he uh, faces satan's temptation he tempts him in the same ways as he tempted adam and eve and yet fails 
And then in verse 11, it says, And the devil left him, and immediately angels came and ministered to him. I want to make sure this is very clear. Satan fails to tempt Jesus. Jesus didn't fail. Satan failed to tempt Jesus to sin. Uh, and after that, angels came and ministered to him. In what way? We, we don't precisely know. Uh, but these angels came to the aid of their Lord and in some way ministered to him, encouraged him, or uh, protected him, however that means, in his humanity. Whatever that looks like, we're not given specifics. We see uh, angels again active in uh, Luke 22, 43. Um, and of course, this is the angels uh, again ministering to the Lord. And we want to note that, that the Lord, as he he, uh, the Lord Jesus, as he goes about his his ministry and his life and throughout various, it's not just one gospel author, but all the gospel authors recognize that there is an angelic involvement again in his humanity. He was ministered to, he, was, he responded to angelic attention, if you might call it that. So uh, Luke 22, 43, Luke 22, 43 says, uh, and they were all amazed at the, oops, nope, that's 100% not the right chapter. Luke 22, 43. There we are. 22, 43 tells us. There you go. It's, I'm getting, as I get, every year I get older, it seems like the little numbers get smaller. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. So here's Jesus on the Mount of Olives praying uh, that not thy will, but or not my will, but thine be done. And Pray, asking the disciples to pray, and we see again angels come and minister to him. What that looked like, what that was about, we don't know. In fact, how the disciples know, we can only assume, was because Jesus told them and revealed that to them sometime in that 40-day 40, 40 period after the resurrection. But whatever the case, uh, angels were doing God's will in ministering to Jesus Christ in his humanity in this time. We, see, uh, we next see angels at the resurrection as described in Matthew 28, 2. And finally in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, so angels obviously making the, uh, the declaration. He's not here. He is risen just as he said. Right? In Acts uh, chapter 1, we see angels again. What Jesus uh, you know, promises them that he's coming back. It's not for them to know the days and the seasons. And then he ascends up and he's uh, covered by a cloud. The Shekinah glory takes him. He's translated into heaven. And understandably, the disciples just keep looking up. Like they said he's going, coming back. Do we just sit here and wait until then? Um, which is an understandable thought. He, they, they thought that he was coming back. In fact, the doctrine of eminency is secure and sure that the disciples expected Jesus to come back at any time. Um, and yet, verse 10 says, And when they looked in, intently toward heaven, he ascended. Suddenly two men stood by them in white garments. Another key feature of these normal we might call them uh, regular duty angels or messengers of the Lord, said, Men of Galilee, why stand looking toward heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you in he to heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So again, important events being uh, angels are used and appear to, uh, to, to, to declare and explain what's going on. And so they explain that um, so that they might know, could God have used a voice from heaven? Surely, but he honored those angels to use them in that, uh, in that capacity. Next, we see that angels have a function and a purpose. They're ministering spirits in Hebrews 1, 14. So we go to Hebrews 1, 14. Hebrews 1 is a very powerful passage, especially as, honestly, the more you learn about angels and the more you study about angels, the more they become fascinating, intriguing, wonderful. They're amazing creations of God, most certainly. And we have to rep recognize that and also hold into account that it was always a trouble. It was always a, a concern or a risk, you might say, that uh, believers might get over-interested or over-obsessed or consumed with angelic worship. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews opens up with. He says, angels are neat and great and powerful, but they're just, uh, they're subservient to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So he doesn't deny their importance. He doesn't deny their ministry, what they do. In fact, in 114, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Well, that's you and I. So they're ministering spirits just as they ministered to uh, Christ in his earthly ministry. Uh, so the angels, we can assume, are ministering for the benefit of those re receiving salvation, whether or not that is unseen support that we're uh, not aware of, sent by God, um, or it is uh, 
just speaking about angelic activity constantly working towards the end of ministering to, in, in a more general sense, uh, it, it's, it's um, maybe we might say slightly unclear, but whatever we know about angels, we can know with absolute dogmatic certainty that God's purpose for them, for the uh, holy angels, is to uh, minister to us who will inherit salvation to uh, help support us in that goal. So as we move forward, we see that there's spectators and watchers. Now this is interesting because spectators or the watchers is the most common or one of the most common phrases for angels in um, the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, these extra biblical texts. And I want to be very clear, these extra biblical texts are not scripture. They're not authoritative, but they were accepted as important to the ancient Jewish world. Some of them are authentic and many of them might be inauthentic, but they gave us an idea of what they saw about angels. And one of the most common phrases used for them was watchers. And so if we go to Psalm 10320, We'll look at a couple of these to help us understand part of the purpose of angels. We already saw that they were present at creation. God almost kind of created his audience first and then the beauty of uh, the beauty of creation so that they could sing and, and celebrate what he'd done so that they could see it so that there would be witnesses to that, uh, created witnesses to that very event. We go to one, uh, Psalm 103 and verse 20. We see, bless the Lord, you his angels who are mighty and do his commands and obey the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you servants who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works and places of dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So this picture of the angels were created just as we were to glorify God, to worship God, to witness his greatness, his goodness, his love, his power, his majesty, his creation. Angels have that uh, purpose in, in God's uh, perfect plan. Um, the next passage that we'll look at is um, Luke 12, 8 through 9. Luke 12, 8 through 9, give us a, a view of these angels as, as spectators, as watchers, if you like. They get involved uh, from time to time upon God's command to carry a message, to carry out a judgment, to do something. But for the most part, we see that their job is to, uh, is to watch, is to um, be, again, watchers or spectators in this whole great drama as they're growing to know the character, nature, and goodness of God, just as we are, although in a different uh, way, uh, due to their <laughs> their being and their nature. So, uh, verse 8 says of chapter 11, oh, sorry, Luke 12, not 11, uh, of Luke 12 and verse 8 and 9, it says, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him will the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Uh, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So we have this picture here. Jesus Christ is explaining to his uh, disciples that the person who um, confesses that uh, confesses Christ before men will be confessed before angels uh, by the Son of God. Um, I believe that this is having to do with rewards, not with salvation. Nevertheless, uh, the point that we're drawing from this is that angels are there to spectate. God created these heavenly watchers to spectate and know and see and understand uh, what's going on. And so it is meaningful that as we come before our judgment seat before uh, God and the Bema seat, uh, that it is valuable that while we're being recognized uh, for what Christ was able to do through us, we'll find that the angels are the watchers. So that's the main point we want to take from that verse uh, today. Uh, we'll also go to 1 Peter 12, because that's another passage of great import in just this topic. In fact, uh, Peter gives us some wonderful information about our angelology, or what we believe about angels, uh, that we certainly don't want, to, uh, don't want to overlook. So 1 Peter 1 and verse 12 says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you concerning things which now reported to you by those who have preached the gospel to you through the Holy Spirit who is sent from heaven, things into which angels desire to look. Uh, 
It's amazing to think that as God utilized his uh, holy apostles and prophets to write and bring forth scripture, that there were angels peeking over their shoulder, dying to look at what the scripture would yet say, wanting, dying is the wrong term, but longing to look into uh, what the plan of God would be. And of course, as the Son of God walked on earth and to their absolute marvel, I'm sure, as humanity did not recognize the light, did not recognize her creation or creator, uh, our creator that, that uh, they were uh, flabbergasted by the humility and love and uh, wonder of our God. So again, this picture of angels as watchers, they're longing to look, they're longing to see, they're the witnesses to everything that is going on, if you like. They're the created uh, witnesses of God. So we want to just look at one uh, other kind of byproduct. There's, usually we like to, you know, back things up with several scriptures for good reason. We don't want to take things out of context or grab things, but there is a very beautiful uh, account of angels that might uh, may seem very likely to be typical. It would be difficult to be dogmatic about it, but it is uh, worth a look. So if we go to Luke 16, 22, we find that Jesus is giving the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it's quite valuable and important even to notice that this is not a parable. Sometimes this uh, rich man and Lazarus gets lumped in with the parables, but we see that it actually... Um, it, uh, it does not have the same marks. It's not said to be a parable. This is actually a story. This is an account of something that happened uh, between uh, the rich man and Lazarus. It has so many things that it doesn't that are not common uh, with parables. Names are used, right? Lazarus is, is an individual's name. It's not just a poor man and a rich man as a parable would often have. We see that places and times and, and different uh, discussions are happening. So this is I believe a real description of what's going on in the world. Uh, in this, in this, it's a very, very real picture of a spiritual reality, including the uh, the the place of punishment and the gulf that is fixed between them. Uh, however, Luke sixteen twenty two says it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's presence. The rich man also d- died and was buried. So here, Lazarus, Lazarus, who uh, in his poverty trusted only God, and the rich man who in his wealth trusted his wealth and rejected God, uh, rejected God's grace. And so um, rich, uh, Lazarus is carried by angels' arms. Now, again, I can't ma- be dogmatic about this, but I think this gives us a great intuition that the moment you pass away, that moment a saint of God, a beloved child of God who's trusted in his grace and trusted in his work in Jesus Christ passes away, that you are met upon, really, you fall asleep, but you wake up face to face with the Lord, and there's some angelic agency that comes. You're met by a, by an angel of God, very likely, who will conduct you uh, into, the, into the presence of your Messiah. Again, not to be dogmatic, but it is a comforting picture as we recognize that um, as we're kind of pulled out of the pool of this life and we leave all the other people behind of our uh, for a short time that we've loved that there's someone on the other side pulling us through it's a beautiful picture i think Um, and now uh, our final little point here we see that uh, angels move between heaven and earth so they move they're moving they're constantly moving in fact um between between heaven and earth and so we'll look at um look at these pictures in genesis 28 12. go to genesis 28 12 and this is the picture of um jacob's ladder of course Uh, so jacob is on the run from his brother and he's looking about and he doesn't see he doesn't. Uh, he's sleeping with his head on a rock. He's, he's got nothing to his name, and the Lord chooses to reveal this beautiful picture to him, and uh, that that portrays a lot. In fact, Jesus Christ identifies himself as that ladder, as that running place between heaven and earth, and yet. Um, 2812 describes this vision that he had and don't think of a ladder like we think of. Think of a staircase. Like oh, it's probably a better way to put that. Um, so a staircase with angels going up and down on it. Uh, Genesis 28, 12 says he dreamed. That's Joseph, uh, Jacob, sorry, Jacob. He dreamed and saw a ladder set up on the earth with the top of it reaching to heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. So here we see that there's this 
myriad of angels that seem to be constantly ascending and descending. So what's the picture we have? Is that angels are um, constantly moving between heaven and earth. And this this picture of, uh, of Jacob's ladder or Jacob's staircase, we might say. Um, that there are angel, there's angels kind of going back up. Or we might think of it going on active duty or maybe even looking into their shift, but they're constantly actively moving between uh, heaven and earth, and there's regular uh, movement between those two, uh, those two places, those two locations, if you want to call it. Um, so we look at Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. We see this idea confirmed, that angels are moving and going up, uh, up and down between uh, heaven and earth. Where are we at here? Hebrews 12, 22 through 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church and the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God and judge it all, and made the spirits of righteousness when made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than that of Abel. So here this uh, picture of, again, uh, of our, uh, the heavenly involvement, the involvement between angels in heaven and, uh, of course, uh, people on earth. So with that, we're going to move forward on to Satan and demons. And again, uh, I would I wanted to break this into two or three lessons, but uh, really for the scope of this course, we're really just trying to give you a background and uh, let you note. So the first thing we already noted is that Satan is a created being. We looked up Colossians 1.16. He's one of the created powers and principalities. He's not his, He's not self-existent like God. He is none of the characteristics of God to the degree that God has as a created being. He is limited in time and space. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. In fact, the reality is, is that you very likely will never be directly uh, in contact with Satan. In fact, he spends seemingly most of his time in the heavenly courtroom trying to essentially wheel and deal with God, accusing the brethren uh, and uh, trying to essentially scheme and, and, and mastermind, if you like, the plan. So what, he's limited in time and space. He's limited in knowledge. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know the future um, because he's a created being. Now, he's a more powerful created being than we would be or than we would ever be, uh, could ever imagine ourselves being, uh, but he, and beautiful and wise and all these things, but we recognize, we must recognize that he is a created being. Next, we note his fall and purpose, and to that we look at first uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Here we see... Um, he takes on the form of an animal, which is not surprising uh, at all, because the uh, the the newly formed Adam and Eve were still learning. They would likely have seen different angelic creatures, and you think about it with their scope, whether it was animals or angels, they wouldn't have had a huge discriminative. Like they might have known difference, and the main difference might be that they spoke or talked or communicated meaningfully. Um, so we can see why Adam and Eve weren't overly shocked at the idea of a, a talking serpent. Uh, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but from the fruit of the trees, tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You will not eat of it, nor will you touch it or else you will die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave it to her husband, and he ate. So, this picture that um, the Lord, or sorry, that the Lord um, allowed the enemy to be in the garden. Uh, like I say, I think that predated his fall. I think this was the moment of his rebellion. Um, but whatever the case, his uh, fall, he, he rebelled against God and his purpose, and he tried to offer essentially Adam and Eve the same package that he was after. He wanted to know that um, he wanted to be God of this world, and so he needed to disconnect them, who were the rightful stewards of this world, from their uh, position, because he knew that he couldn't overpower God, and take this or take this domain from them. But in fact, if he got them uh, away from the power of God, then that would hap uh, they would happen. 
uh, in the next passage that we see of of import and understanding the uh, movement of the demons is in Genesis 6, 1 and 2. And Genesis 6, 1 and 2 says, When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were fair and took as wives uh, as they chose, any they chose. The Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he is flesh, yet his days will be a hundred and twenty years. So in this uh, chapter, Genesis chapter 6, there's uh, certainly theological debate, but uh, to me it seems to be there's that there's no other right right thinking understanding of who the sons of God are. That's used by Job, a, con, uh, a work of a contemporaneous to Abraham. Um, to, to describe the angelic world. So I think that what this describes is that the sons of God, there were angels who had seen Satan's success and for whatever reason were tempted by whatever dominion they might be able to have uh, by falling and going under his rule and maybe tempted certain ones of them by the desire to uh, have familiar relations with human women and have offspring that were in the image of God um, and thus defy and defile God and again be in that sense, masters of their own destiny. Uh, and that desire uh, caused a third of the angels to fall with Satan. Uh, that might not all have happened at this time, but I think that's why they're called sons of God and they're not called demons at this point, because they're sons of God until they make that choice to defy the Lord and, and violate their rightful domain, as Peter, and, uh, Peter talks about. So um, this is a, a picture, if you like. Of those uh, of the fall of uh, Satan and then the fall of other angels after his example uh, somewhere it seems that that process of angels falling is no longer going on the chips have fallen the judgments have been cast and and everyone's pretty much decided what side they're going to be on the next two major passages that have to do with Satan and his angels uh, or Satan, rather, more specifically, are Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, and Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. And both of those passages take earthly kings and they compare them to the power that in, uh, that is empowering them, which is Satan. So essentially we get descriptions about Satan and his uh, role in his life. He, he evidently lived an unfallen time in the garden, ministering in both the Garden of Eden, as, as we find in Ezekiel, as well as on heaven, uh, had, as we saw, movement between heaven and earth and, and fulfilled that purpose until such time as he decided that he would like to be like the Most High and chose to tempt Adam and Eve to steal this, this domain, steal this world uh, from him. Right? So, uh, again, we won't have time to exegete those passages today, but Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, again, without perfect agreement among theologians, but seem to give us information that we wouldn't otherwise have about Satan. However, we are 100% sure about the nature of Revelation 12. So we'll talk about Revelation 12 very briefly. Mark 2, or Mark 5, 2 through 5. Oh, sorry, uh, Revelation 12, 3 through 4. I'm jumping ahead a point, aren't I? Revelation 12, 3 through 4, again, gives us a beautiful picture, a beautiful image. John sees a sign in heaven. It says, a great sign appeared in heaven. Going back to verse 1, sorry. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Stars. She was with child and cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Another, so here's a picture of a woman. So this is the nation of Israel being uh, viewed, pictured as a woman, and she's bringing forth the Christ child. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and there was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. He, his tail drew a third of the stars out of heaven, and he threw them down to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. Uh, she gave birth to a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron scepter, and her child was t caught up to God on his throne. So here is um, here is a picture of, in, in this symbolism, right? There's a sign in the heavens, the stars. He's looking up and seeing this kind of play out amongst the stars, which again shows the uh, angelic nature of what's going on. And he says that another uh, this great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems, again, a picture of Satan and his desire to rule over this cosmos. So um, 
we see that Satan has a purpose, and we're going to look at his, his goal or his end, I should say, uh, as we go on in our study. But uh, we want to note that, uh, just take a brief t- pause and talk about demonic possession. Demonic possession is absolutely real. It's a thing that happens. We see from Scripture that it can take on many forms, including cause, causing uh, physical defects and problems uh, like epilepsy or um, uh, mental instability or what we'd call insanity. And uh, we do want to make very, very clear that Dr. Luke is, um, uh, is, is crystal clear that there are physical maladies. There are times when we're sick. There's times when um, maybe our you know chemical imbalance in our mind might cause depression. There might be just biological influences to the point. Um, when you get a cold, every time you get a cold, it's not because a demon gave you a cold. In fact, what we'll find is that you're probably guard, you're guarded by the Holy Spirit from that kind of demonic uh, attack and that kind of demonic uh, control. Uh, for the most part. In fact, as we see in demonic possession in the various instances, which they mostly center around uh, the working of, or the most information we can draw about the demonic possession besides those two passages in Ezekiel and Isaiah that clearly uh, suggest demonic possession of those uh, kings that are compared to or used to describe Satan. But we find that demonic possession really ramps up, if you like, in the gospel accounts. And as the Dr. Fruchtenbaum, Ronald Fruchtenbaum pointed out, that it seems that when the light came into the world, the entire satanic and demonic network seemed to gather around to try to blot out, try to cover up the light. So we see a lot more demonic possession in the book of, uh, in the books, in the gospels than we do in the book of Acts. There's some in Acts, but very little. And there's almost none in the Old Testament. There's very, very little demonic, uh, visible demonic possession activity. Again, it's there, but it's a rarity. And it is probably a rarity. Uh, in fact, we'd say it's a rarity for us today. Uh, and we would a- also point out that because you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer today, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, resurrection for your sin, then you are full of the Holy Spirit. And for lack of a better term, as foolish as we might be, and as much as we might be influenced by demons, we'll look at this, uh, that the the demons can never get in. They can never possess us or control us. Now, that is tragically not the case for the non-believer. I believe there are steps and permissions that must be taken, uh, but at the same time, if a person yields themselves or becomes the victim of a demon, then demon demonizing or uh, demonic possession is still absolutely a potentiality. This is why it's so dangerous and so scary when we see uh, young people or people in general being attacked uh, attracted to the the occult to you know uh, Ouija boards or all the other horrifying uh, demonic pagan religion Wiccanism and all these other gross and disgusting religions uh, have come up and have been in many ways resurrected and people are observing them in their covens and they're observing them with uh, various different expressions and it's important to note that it is evil it is evil and it has opening oneself up to darkness, similarly with the New Age emptying of the mind. In fact, even this works its way into Christian tradition. And you get uh, various uh, Christians or Catholic background Christians who are talking about centering prayer and mind emptying, emptying prayer. What are you emptying your mind for, right? We're meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're meant to have our minds filled with Holy Scripture. That's what gives us peace. And so... Um, when we see these occult practices, these Eastern meditation practices, we should be wary of them because they are essentially opening and making yourself available to demonic influence or possibly, if you're not a believer, demonic possession. Um, so this is a very, very important point to note that demonic possession is real. Demonic, demonic possession exists. And the only uh, cure, if you want to call it that, for demonic possession is trusting in Christ. And he'll drive out the whole, uh, drive out those demons and drive out that demonic influence by the power of his Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, uh, we note, and we're not given a lot of uh, procedure by which to do that because essentially the procedure is point to Jesus. That's the procedure when dealing with uh, demonic influences. So while demons cannot possess believers because we're full, they certainly can have influence on believers. So we look to Ephesians 6, 12 for that purpose. Ephesians, Philippians, went too far, didn't I? There we go. Ephesians. There we go. Ephesians 6, 12. 
says, For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against the great spiritual forces of evil, sorry, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. So, um, Paul is very clear, he's just talking about the armor of God, right, in the battle against evil, that we are taking part, that there is a, a, a demonic influence, their demonic powers, their demonic worlds against which we stand by the power of God. And we're fighting, we're a part of that battle against them. And how do we do that? We want to note that um, this this wartime imagery, right, of the, uh, of the full armor of God and the like is not literal. We're not going to go out there and grab a sword and fight. It's, uh, it is speaking of our ability to speak truth and point to Jesus Christ, not be deceived by the lies of Satan, not be deceived by the lies of this world, but to rather speak truth continually. And that is the way in which we do battle, if you want to say, by constantly prayer in prayer and in uh, scripture study and proclamation and proclamation of the gospel. We do battle against the deception and lies of the evil one. Um, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 is going to be important uh, very shortly in our study again, so we may as well look it up here. 1 Timothy 3. Do, 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 do. 4, right, sorry. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 reads, Now the Spirit clearly says that in the last time some will depart from the faith and pay attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and not to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for if it is sanctified, though by the word of God and prayer. Okay, what a... A picture that is. We note here that uh, demo demons, demons, that's uh, French, I guess, demons are, are uh, not able to um, possess Christians. However, demons can uh, seduce us and de delude us, and it says there's doctrines of demons. So demons are trying to teach against or, or convince against Scripture. So what do you see when you turn on you know, the History Channel, you see the top 10 biggest mistakes in the Bible? Doctrines of demons. They're uh, making counterfeit stories and counter stories, whether it's the ridiculous old earth evolutionary dogma that, that can't be confirmed nor truly <laughs> even given str strong evidence, or it's some other uh, idea about... Um, you know, there being no men or women or masculinity and femininity or whatever it is that goes against the word of God, particularly the doctrines of demons that have to do with salvation by works. Just do your best and God will be happy with that. Or just do your best and pray. Or Jesus gives you 90% and you do the other 10%, right? All those ideas are doctrines of demons. They're lies from the pit of hell. And that is the purpose of, of uh, the satanic and demonic world. They want to deceive um, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. So this uh, idea of people looking after spiritism or the holy, uh, sorry, the unholy uh, demonic world for direct revelation from them. And it's very important to note that um, that is most likely what is going on even in many uh, charismatic circles where people are so badly seeking after some sort of supernatural experience that the Holy Spirit and the Word of the Lord has not promised and is not offered. And so in pursuing it, they open themselves up not to uh, angelic or heavenly influence, but towards demonic influence because they're looking after an experience instead of looking after the provision of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Word of God. So... Uh, finally, we want to note the, the limitations. Job 1, 6 through 12 uh, gives us a picture of the limitations of Satan. That is to say, he cannot do everything that he wants to do. In fact, he can't do anything that he wants to do. He has to always run it past, if you like, run it by God, especially when he uh, desires to do something uh, to, to mess with one of God's people or one of God's saints. So Job 1, 6 through 12 um, gives us that picture. We see here the uh, sons of God, all the angels are gathered together in the heavenly courtroom. I don't know whether it's like the uh, State of the Union address or something, but they're all gathering together to talk, and Satan steps on the scene, had already fallen, already doing his job as the adversary, uh, as the accuser of the brethren, as the um, opponent of God. 
<clears throat> starting from verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, again, all the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And the adversary came among them, also came among them. So here we see a picture of uh, the angel of the Lord being called sons of God and then Satan being distinguished from them because he had fallen. He had ceased to be uh, have that holy position. It says, And the Lord came to the adversary, from where have you, said to the adversary, From where have you come? Then the adversary answered the Lord, saying, From roaming on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to the adversary, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, and a blameless and upright man who fears God and avoids evil? Then the adversary answers the Lord, saying, Has Job feared God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possession have increased on, in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to the adversary, look, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against his person. So the adversary departed from the presence of the Lord. So here is a, a powerful image of Satan wanting to steal, kill, and destroy, wanting to destroy Job, the, the righteous man of God. And um, yet he cannot do it until such time as God allows him. And when God allows him, he says, you can take his stuff, but don't touch his person. And then Satan fails to make, or that fails to cause enmity between God and Job, or Job and God. And so he says, well, you, it's, you kept, you left it, let him have his health. And so then the Lord allows Satan to take his health at that point. Um, so this horrible trial that we see was uh, only committed by the permissive will of God. And it's important to notice that um, God's purpose in the short term is not for our happiness. God's purpose is for us to be glorified, or for him to be glorified through our lives, rather. And so that'll mean that there will be difficulties and trials, some absolutely undeserved and inexplicable, for the purpose of showing the greatness of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't worry. There is a greater. There are greater times ahead. Another important passage on this very topic of the limitations of Satan, the limits of his power, and the fact that they very specifically uh, he de cannot reach out or stretch out his hand against the saints unless the Lord gives him permission. If the Lord gives him permission, it is for the greatest good of those who love him, and it is for his ultimate glory just as we see in this own uh, very difficult time with the virus and all the challenges that have come as a result of that and the, the great suffering that we've seen in the church of God, it is shown to glorify uh, the, the Lord through his ways of, of, of sustaining us and, and the faithfulness of his church. Uh, 2231, Jesus speaking to Peter says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have repented, strengthen your brothers. So here is Satan about to have his finest hour, if you like, that moment of victory where he, uh, you know, is able to kill the Son of God in his human form and put him into, or in his human, in his humanity, to kill the humanity of the Son of God, to declare victory over him. And Satan comes up and says, I want to sift Peter. I want to get to Peter, uh, which means that he couldn't do it if he hadn't had the Lord's permission. And the Lord gave him permission, along with praying for the reality that this would be the event that would strengthen Peter and prepare him for his, give him that humility he needed to finally become the leader that the Lord wanted him to be. So, uh, for our last kind of, uh, our last slide in this discussion, we notice that Satan is judged uh, right at the beginning in uh, Genesis 3.15, sometimes called the Proto-Evangelion, uh, or the first telling of the gospel, we see that Satan uh, sinned in tempting Adam and Eve and deceiving Adam and Eve about the character of God and promising them that they could be like God, exactly what his desire was, and kind of, uh, in that sense, won them to, her camp, to his camp. God questions Adam, God questions Eve, but then God just sentences the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. You will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. So this is when we start looking at, to the seed line of the Messiah. The seed line is promised here, but most importantly, we see that that seed of the Messiah would crush the head of Satan. Um, crush the head of Satan. 
Uh, so his judgment was stated right from the beginning that his head would be bruised, a fatal wound would be do- dealt to him at the end of all this thing. We find that the demons and Satan know that they are destined for eternal punishment. We go to Matthew 8, 29 or Luke 8, 31, but they both give us the same picture. Jesus is having regular uh, discussions as he's casting out these demons. Some of them are able to converse with him. They all recognize him as God, but he silences them because he doesn't want demonic... Um, testimony to represent but they knew him because they were uh, they've seen him in all of his glory they knew exactly who he was as is as the son of god <clears throat> but matthew 8 29 829 says suddenly they cried out saying what have we to do with you jesus son of god have you come here to torment us before the time so they know, these demons know, they're terrified. Here's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepping on the scene, and they're terrified that Jesus is going to torment them before the appointed time. They know there's appointed time, similarly uh, in the, in the um, passage in Luke 8, 31. Um, we find that there was a judgment of uh, these demons at the cross. And the judgment of these demons at the cross is uh, recorded in several places, but we'll look at John 12, 31. You see that when Jesus Christ paid the sin debt and was risen again, and that certified his, uh, his the, the efficacy and the power of his act, proved it, if you like, um, before the world. You might say it's sort of the receipt on that action. Um, and John 12, whoop, John chapter 12 gives us that picture. Um, so 12.31 says... It says, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So um, Jesus is talking about two events. The judgment is d- going to be completed at the cross with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and seating, and he will be cast out. That won't happen until uh, the end. So you see both of those pictures, uh, the fact that Jesus Christ has bought this world with his blood, purchased this world, paid for this world, paid uh, the penalty so that he could redeem this world and cast Satan out, that he would no longer, at a future point in history, have a place. Um, Gen- uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 12, talks about the time when Jesus, or when Jesus will cast, or when the Lord, rather, will cast Satan out of heaven. Currently, as we saw in the book of Job and elsewhere, he can go before the heavenly, uh, in the heavenly throne room. He has no uh, office there, he has no place there, but he has access into heaven. And we're going to see in the future, he's going to lose that uh, that right. He's going to lose that privilege. He's going to lose that access to heaven and be uh, refined to, or confined, rather confined to the earth. So we go to uh, verse 7 of Revelation 12, and it says, then a war broke out in heaven. So future events to us. The Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place for them in heaven any longer. The great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God is the authority of Christ. Uh, who is to come for the accuser of our brothers who was accused before or who accused them before our god day and night has been cast down they overcame him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death therefore rejoice o heavens and you will dwell in them woe unto the unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short so here, uh, again, a picture of a time in the future when Satan's, you, you imagine, kind of God keeps drawing the circle smaller. Satan has his maximum uh, reign in the early chapters of Genesis. And each time when God judges the world at the flood, their circle gets smaller. De- Satan and his demons have a little bit less that they can do. And they can't, uh, they can, they're still enabled to possess certain humans, but they're not able to cohabitate with humans. So things just keep getting smaller. The circle keeps getting smaller at the cross. The circle keeps getting smaller, the group of people that he can 
and influence or try to destroy. Uh, and finally, as we come towards the end times, as we look at this moment in the tribulation period, the halfway point of the tribulation period, he is cast forth. He no longer even has access to lodge his accusations and lodge his complaints. He sees the noose tightening, if you like, around him and thus turns all of his satanic fury to the destruction of the nation of Israel, God's chosen earthly people. Um, Fast forward to Revelation 20, 1 through 3, and we see Satan's uh, eventually confined to the abyss. This is after the seven-year tribulation. The Lord um, comes down, and Jesus Christ comes down in person. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you'll be with him, you'll be behind him as he comes to... Uh, uh, wage war in the campaign of Armageddon and claim this earth uh, for himself. Verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1 and following says, I then And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended and then that he must be set free for a little while. So um, we see that Satan is going to have a thousand year uh, time in the Abusas is the Greek word, and that's where we have the English word abyss. This is a bottomless pit, just the sensation of uh, falling, if you like, whatever that means to a spiritual being like uh, Satan. Nevertheless, this is not pleasant experience for a thousand years, after which he is released by God to deceive the nations for one more moment at the end of the millennial kingdom, and finally, uh, finally is judged uh, as we see in Revelation 20 and verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever. So ultimately, he will take his place without trial um, immediately in the, uh, play, in the lake of fire that was prepared for him and all of his demons. So, if you are taking this course for, for credit, we want to encourage you to uh, take seriously this upcoming assignment. We'd like you to take one passage, one important passage, um, f either from above or from one of the many other angelic passages, and um, give us a description of either um, something that you learn from that passage about the elect angels, about Satan, or about demons, um, either from those above or choose your own. Write briefly on what that passage tells us about angelic beings. This has been a long uh, study indeed, and, and probably the biggest one so far. I'm not sure that's uh, the justification for that being, that it just covers such a great variety of issues. But again, I hope it reminds us that Jesus Christ, the Savior, is the focus of our faith, that he is in control, that he has authority and power, that his network of angels and his uh, created beings, just like us, exist to glorify him and serve him and worship him. And that is what Christ has redeemed us to do, is to take part in that host, in that company of the, uh, of the redeemed. And so with that, I pray that God richly blesses you and that you enjoyed this study. And we'll see you next time.